Uh, welcome to another one of our webinars. Um, some of you have hopefully been on and listened to some in the past. Um, these are brought to you by the American Academy of Neurology as part of our academic initiative. Um, here's our first slide. Great. So my name is Dr. Ralph Sacco. I'm chair of the uh, academic initiative and immediate past president for the American Academy of Neurology. These are some of them that now have been listed uh, in the AAN website. We did quite a number on COVID-19, sharing best practices, reactivation, post-surge, neurology departments, addressing systemic racism was a very important one that came out right around uh, July at the height of the uh, racial injustice issues, managing financial repercussions of COVID-19 in neurology departments, and resetting research operations within neurology departments during COVID. These were all listed there, and you can find them on the special um, offering page for the AAN. Next slide. Uh, we have then shifted, as you know, the academic initiative has been hard at work and had a number of chair summit. The last chair summit was canceled because of COVID, but we decided to take what some of those things that were being planned at that chair summit and bring them to you uh, in these virtual formats as part of a webinar. So in November, we offered adapting your department for coding changes, lessons learned uh, from long-term EEG and preparing for e &M changes, faculty compensation models, trials and tribulations, which also was built on a, 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 a paper that was written by the academic initiative on funds flow, and then strategic planning and exec execution during a dynamic changing environment was another one that we had offered. These are all available, AAN.com and the AAN YouTube channel. Next slide. So today um, is another one that was built uh, for, and we were planning to uh, offer at the chair summit back in March. And happy to say that we have a great division work group uh, and Brenda and Claire who are gonna be with us today were part of that work group. And they had worked up part of this program. And so our focus is divide and conquer the role of division chiefs in neurology. Some departments have many division chiefs. Some departments have less numbers of division chiefs. Not all division chiefs have, um, you know, in terms of career development pathway, some division chiefs ultimately become department chairs. So we thought it would be important, at least in one hour, to offer some advice from some uh, chairs out there. Uh, next slide. So I have a great panelist group of chairs and academic business administrators. Um, Brenda Banwell, who chairs really a department uh, at uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, a pediatric neurologist. Jane Check, who's been with us in the past, and she is actually the co-chair of now our, our academic business administrators group from UCSF. David Greer, who's chair of neurology and part of our department chairs work group at the Boston University School of Medicine. Claire Henschcliffe, who was part of the uh, division work group uh, and helped develop this program and now is a chair at the University of California, Irvine. And uh, Andy Josephson, who is also one of the chairs on our uh, department chair work group and has been on a few of these webinars in the past and works obviously with Jane at UCSF. And then Ross Vincent, an MBA with, from the Neurological Institute of Cleveland Medical Center. So I really wanna thank them for being part of the panel today and help to uh, answer some of the questions. So to give it this start, we thought we'd break it into a couple different uh, parts today. And I thought one of the first parts is, you know, do uh, does every department really uh, need divisions? I mean, some departments are smaller, some departments are larger. You know, are there pros and cons of having a division structure? Even division structures are different in terms of how much autonomy, how much information is given them, how they all work together in certain divisions, divisions working with, um, you know, other systems of care that are existent in the, uh, in the health system. So I thought we'd kind of go through around the room a bit and ask a little bit about, you know, tell us a little about the current division structure in your department. Um, how does it work? What are the advantages and disadvantages? And just some overall comments just to get us started. And so I think I'm going to kick it off with one of the people that was instrumental in putting the program together. So uh, Brenda Banwell, do you want to give it a start? Sure. Uh, so thank you all for joining. Um, it's really uh, great to have a chance to discuss this, and I look forward to doing it in person in the future. Um, so I have a rather unusual job. Um, I'm a division chief, but I have 62 faculty, over 150 members of my division, um, and function in all intents and purposes in, uh, for this conversation 
um, somewhat like a department in pediatric neurology in terms of infrastructure and how we run our group. Um, but I do report to two chairs, uh, Department of Pediatrics for fiscal and programmatic growth for children and Department of Neurology for academic um, and neuroscience, which is actually a wonderful position uh, for a child neurology division to be in. I have autonomy, but I also report in very relevant ways uh, across two different departments. But I think the key question on structure relates a great deal to what you want to get done. Uh, and so within our group in child neurology, um, I have sections that in other groups might be called divisions, each of whom has a section uh, lead who has 10% protected effort to take charge of that group. For example, our epilepsy group is over 30 people. Um, uh, and they have specific responsibilities, um, including reporting to me at our executive council. I also have two directors. Uh, one of operations um, and one of strategy, um, who are my right and left hands uh, when it comes to a great deal of our sort of bigger admit, uh, sort of programmatic growth, bigger initiatives. Uh, and then more recently, uh, within my institution, um, I now direct um, a new entity of neuroscience, uh, which is allowing me to, uh, in partnership uh, with the uh, head of neurosurgery, to grow across what we're calling a neighborhood construct of neuroscience. Um, and the reason I mention all of that is it really is about empowering different people to bring new things to the group, which allow the entire group to do more and more effectively. Uh, and uh, critical to that is accountability. So each of the section heads, which could be also division chiefs in, in different areas, have defined responsibilities, um, meet with their faculty, represent their faculty, um, and various aspects of our work as a, as a larger group, um, and bring things to me with solutions. Uh, which is also an absolutely essential thing when you empower colleagues. So I'll stop there because I, I don't want to over uh, uh, monopolize the conversation, but I'm happy to come back to any of those points. Yeah, and I see the questions coming in um, that we'll uh, hopefully deal with in a minute, but why don't we just hear first from all of them and maybe we'll pepper in some of these questions. Um, so you're right, it's like you really have like a, a mega division that is really important <laughs> to most. I, one of the questions was sections versus divisions. We'll get back to that. But let's hear about UCSF, another mega department. And I think we're going to give it to Jane or Andy. Who's going to take I'll, it? I'll start. Thank you. It's great being part of this panel. Um, at UCSF, uh, we started a divisional structure in 2008. Before that time, all faculty reported to the chair. And we started divisions due to the growth in the number of faculty. During the chair's tenure, uh, the faculty size had increased from 18 to almost 100. And the chair could no longer provide meaningful individualized attention to the faculty. The department was very flat and not at all hierarchical. So the culture didn't really lend itself to all of a sudden having an org chart. So we started with a circle with the mission in the middle and we put little spokes like around the wheel and every area had its own name, no one bigger or reporting to another. And they sort of became um, academic homes for the faculty. And people gravitated naturally to one of these homes. For the most part, it was very clear. And it was really based on clinical specialty. And within that specialty, um, we did sort of a translational approach. So we would put the researchers and the clinicians all in one group so that they could have the advantages of the kind of the bench to bedside. And most, um, most of what we did was specialties. We had a few geographical uh, divisions uh, based at, for example, the VA or our county hospital SFGH. So we were, we were flexible, um, we rolled it out sort of as something that would be of great um, interest and benefit to the faculty. Now, 13 years later, this same foundation has stood the test of time. It has evolved. Um, we now have um, almost 250 faculty. Andy is the chair now, and he's taken this to the next level, and he'll talk about some of that. We have 18 divisions. The largest is our memory and aging center, and they have um, almost 100 people. And our smallest is uh, headache, they have four. So there's a, quite a variety there. We have four vice chairs um, that are global, they don't have operational responsibility. 
Um, and we have one associate chair for finance and administration, which is my role. Um, roles of medical directors or others um, are, may or may not be the division chief because we see them as very distinct roles. So quick question here, Jane, just to interrupt you. Are the vice chairs division chiefs or did I just hear they're not? No, they're separate roles. So <laughs> our vice chairs are research, clinical services, education and diversity. And they are actually um, members of the divisions. Um, one of them is a division or two of them are division chiefs. The two of them are not. So, okay, they can. We see them as very distinct roles. And um, I wanted to mention, although we have divisions, we do not have division administrators. In the department, we centralize all finance and HR, including academic affairs, post-award administration, et cetera. Um, and I think that um, this assures that all faculty, no matter what division they're in, get the same basic services. And it, it's not dependent on whether that division ends up with more financial resources than another division. And each division chief has a, a strong working relationship with the chair. And um, as Andy will talk more about later, we have a strong committee structure and, um, and we've, we've developed from there. Yeah, and we'll talk more about support for uh, the division chiefs. Andy, anything to add now, or I know we'll get back to you in a moment. No, I, I think Jane, Jane said it very nicely. It's worked very well for us, but of course we're a, a model of a very large department where you could almost not, it, it would be impossible to do it without division chiefs, I think. And similar, I know in our place, when I first got there, there were some semblance of a division, but as the department grew, definitely moved, because the chair cannot give one-on-one -on -one advice to a department of 250, or even a department over a certain size. You think, does anybody have a magic number? Is there a magic number where when it gets too large for one chair, do you think is there a number or do you think it, it's just all variable? Anybody want to take a stab? Well, or I did it, feel when it was getting to be a hundred, I felt that was an important 100. number because I, I, I think even organizational theory says it's impossible to have just one entity. If it gets over a hundred, you've got to break it up. I would, I would say probably even lower, but. 100 for sure. I think I was going to say 50, but may, maybe it, it's more. What, and one other quick question before we go to the next one. I know it keeps coming up, so I might as well ask, ask it now. In terms of proportion of effort for either section or division directors, and obviously some, I guess, uh, salary support for that. Andy, at UCSF with this big department, uh, do you give some effort in protected time? Yeah, we think of it as around uh, 10%. Uh, most of our division chiefs have an endowed chair. Uh, I think everyone but one. And then that that can serve as, that, um, as the basis for some of that support that they have from an administrative time carved out for their administrative role as division chief. Even though an endowed chair may be more for research, it would allow it to cover the administrative role of division chief? Yeah, we have really flexible endowed chairs at our place that can cover various roles. And we, we view those to large extent when we raise them for a new division chief, for instance, as covering their administrative role. And it doesn't, um, uh, it, it pays out more than just that role. Thankfully. Right, right. So it covers that. Okay. Yeah. But David, let's turn to you a little bit from Boston University. How do things work there? What's your, what are your thoughts about division? And you were a division chief somewhere else before you rose to department chair. Yeah, no, I still feel like a division chief a lot of the time. And I'm, I was hoping that Andy could send me a few of the endowed chairs also, because that sounds really nice. Uh, we don't have that luxury. We are a, a medium sized department, I guess you'd call it. We're about maybe 45, 50 faculty. Um, and we're an academic medical center and a safety net hospital. So we're not doing as well financially. So we have to kind of make do and the whole concept of how do you pay for protecting people's time? It gets very, very challenging in an environment like this. But I, I don't mind having small divisions. In fact, sometimes we'll have a division of only one or two people. And what that does is give some credibility to that, that part of the department that otherwise might not receive it or have representation. They have a seat at the table, literally, uh, when departmental initiatives are being discussed. Even if MS is a small fraction of what we do, for example, and we only have one or two people, it's very important to the overall mission of the department. And we want to hear their, their ideas. So, you know, with the concept of diversity, you might have very well represented divisions uh, that have 
seven or 10 people and others that are very small, but the, the diversity of, uh, of perspective is extremely valuable when you're uh, doing totally different things. If you're a neurointensivist versus a, a purely outpatient movement disorder doc, you're gonna have a very different perspective. It's also nice to have a mix of more senior and more junior people. Uh, they both have advantages. It's not one is better than the other. Uh, some of your senior people are extremely valuable for understanding just having been around the block a time or two, how things work and what works and what doesn't. But a lot of your more junior leaders can have a tremendous fire in the belly, new energy, new perspective, um, desire to really build and grow and be innovative. Uh, and they're all incredibly valuable. So the, you know, as we talk a lot about diversity, this is just another form of diversity that makes a department run really well by having big and small divisions and and junior and senior people. So it all kind of comes together as a nice puzzle. And, and we're all talking about, I heard, I heard Jane mention, I assume these divisions or sections focus around disease oriented areas. I heard MS, I heard uh, uh, neurocritical care, obviously stroke is a division. Do, do most people work that way? Are we getting nods on that? Most of the time, the clinical and research, but being called memory, being the largest one at UCSF, we, we believe they revolve around a, a, a clinical entity in most cases. So Claire, new chair at UC Irvine, division chief not too long ago. What can you tell about how the structure is there or what you're gonna to do to that structure? Yeah, so we're um, uh, really making a transition right now and, and listening to what Jane had said, um, it sounds like we're, we're uh, forming these divisions that have been groups before or programs before where people came together organically and it was very much around the traditional um, subspecialty areas like neuromuscular, neurocritical care, for example. So um, the big question when I arrived is that I, I felt that I would like um, to form formal divisions, but th there was a question of, well, why would I do that when there are already people working together very well in a, in a group structure? And I think that one of the big advantages about um, formalizing the divisions is that it's gonna give me um, the ability to um, take divisions who are functioning really well, who, uh, you know, where the, the um, uh, leader of the division is running a really tight ship, and then where there is a division that maybe is looser with people not working as closely, use that um, tightly run division as a model to roll out to the other divisions. So I would like to um, in, uh, create some standard pathways um, that people can follow within the divisions. Um, and as, a, as an example of a, a division that's run or a group that's run really well, for example, I have a, a couple of programs where they're really having weekly meetings, you know, and running through numbers and looking at uh, the housekeeping for the group, but that really promotes transparency. And so people are working very tightly and in a team. It's also a place where um, they're a sounding board for each other. Um, and we do have, and um, I am gonna continue to encourage this, the researchers uh, actually within the division where it seems most relevant to them. It's a couple of translational researchers where I have them in two divisions and I'm not sure how that's gonna pan out right now. Um, our division sizes are going to be, um, you know, we're a department that's medium sized, we're 50. Um, we, I have a mandate to grow, which is really exciting. And um, our divisions right now, as we've partitioned them out, are generally between four and 10 people in the divisions. And we um, will not be having division administrators. So there's going to be a, a little bit of a hybrid model where a lot of these things are going to be centralized, but I am expecting the division chiefs to really assume a number of roles and responsibilities that are going to help me and they'll report to me. And that makes sense. And some of the questions that are coming in, I think we touched on some advantages. I guess, are there any disadvantages of divisions? They asked about advantages and disadvantages. Um, can anybody think of a disadvantage of a divisional structure? I'm just going to bring up one, which is that um, as, as we are thinking, you know, coming in new, it really gives you the um, opportunity to think in a very creative, very new way. And one question that came up was, well, when we um, are grouping people, um, should we let it be looser so that, for example, we have people who are involved in um, neurodegenerative disorders that would pull from several different traditional divisions, but really allow them to come together and perhaps create a, a different type of of program run in a different way. And I, I think that's 
lovely idea and I'm not quite sure how to make that happen. Yeah. I liked your idea about the chair and some people that are in more than one division. You know, NINDS, when it rearranged a, a long time ago, they created these clusters. And clusters may be another way to go even across divisions for things uh, like, uh, like uh, Northern Generation. Brenda, yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, one disadvantage, um, if you let it happen, is that um, uh, divisions or sections can um, view themselves as having a differential, differential, sorry, contribution to the department, um, and um, that can be divisive. Mm. Uh, so, you know, in in my world, because it's a little bit different than a department within the, within my group, um, my staff that generate procedural finances do not earn more, do differently, or have less call than the people who are on sections or um, that do not. My tenure track faculty participate in an equal amount of weekend and night call as do my clinical faculty. The things that are above and beyond are equitable across the entire group. Interesting. Um, because they're all valued. Everybody has stressors. Everybody contributes. Um, so and I think right. have... um, a divisional structure could divide. And we're going to come back to that about how keeping the team together is still important. You know, in, in our department, I think there are differences across divisions and there are salary differences for a neurocritical care and neurointerventionalist versus someone who may be doing more EM coding. So there are some differentiations. But Ross, I want to hear from you. You're the uh, business administrator for the Neurological Institute at Cleveland Medical Center. How does your structure work? Yeah, absolutely, and thank you for having me on this panel. Um, like many of the, of the others, we have a very functional uh, structure uh, led by Dr. Kathy Sila as our chair, as many know. Um, but uh, again, very functional structure. We have three vice chairs, one for operations, one for research, uh, one for education, um, along with uh, that are separate roles than the division chiefs. Um, very uh, functional divisions based on subspecialty. Um, but one of the things that makes us a little unique is the, the, the sheer geography that we have to cover. Um, in Northeast Ohio, just to give you some perspective, our, our competitive catchment area is about 6,600 square miles uh, spanning uh, you know, just the top right corner of Northeast Ohio, if you can picture on the map. Um, so one of, one of the challenges that we have to overcome is we actually made a separate division for uh, community neurology or general neurology, which actually functions as its own separate division. Um, and so what that really allows us to do is to um, provide service on that scale, but at the same time, uh, drive regionality and hierarchies of care to the subspecialties that are a little bit more subspecialized. So um, just, to, just to add to what uh, the other panelists have said already, but it's just something that uh, one of the unique challenges we have to overcome in, in the Cleveland market. Yeah, general neurology is a great one. And as you know, the president of the American Cabin Neurology is very much pushing more general neurologists out there. So uh, we have a general neurology section or division as well. And I think it's a critical area. One last question before we leave structure. Uh, somebody has a good question here. We talked about the 10% effort, hopefully with an endowed share or other financial support. Do all division chiefs get the same? It's a small division, but they get less effort compared to a larger. I see David shaking his head. All division chiefs get the same amount. Even if it's a small division, it's a similar amount of work. No, actually, I mean, at least in our place, it's uh, we don't have the luxury of being able to do that. Uh, the funding comes from the hospital in terms of protected time for specific uh, division chiefs. And so it's a, kind of an historical thing. If you were a division that's been around for a long time, then you get your 10%. Sometimes you get 20%. Okay. Whereas if you're a new division that's growing, and you've got a lot of work that you're trying to do to build it and grow it, you don't get much protected time at all. And so at least at our place, it often falls on the department to try to fund that, which is uh, really challenging as you're trying to keep your chair package running for as long as possible. Yeah. So we, it's and not a perfect system. At UCSF, other than the endowed chair, if you had to say, are, are, they, are, are they getting equal amounts or different amounts depending on their size? I think relatively equal. Uh, I, I think there are there are some sort of differences. Bigger ones have bigger resources in terms of the overall pool of resources that flow to that division, whether it be research or education or clinical dollars. Uh, but in terms of the administrative job, uh, we keep it the same uh, roughly across the division chiefs. And that's tricky. And I would I would add to that that we don't track that effort. I mean, if people oh. spend whatever time they spend and. Um, most of the, the division chiefs are very engaged. They really want that position. And so they, they have sources of funding to support the time they spend, but we don't, 
really think of it as oh, ten percent of protected time. I mean, they they spend the time that they right, but they you need. do have the endowed shares, and that does help. I mean, if you didn't have an endowed share, you they have other them. sources of salary support. That, okay. But but I just wanted to make it. It's not like a you know, a, a federal award where we're tracking their effort. Like, right, right, agreed. Um, okay, so I'm going to move now from structures. We described our structures. There are variations, small, medium, large, and there are obviously differences in how we support that. But what do we think, um, hearing that we do have many, many division chiefs that are even in our audience today, what do you think are the characteristics that make a good div division chief? What are some of the signs that someone will make, some signs that are positive as well as negative signs uh, for a division chief? And, and let's start with you, Andy. Well, Ralph, I mean, I think um, I think there's no right answer to this, but I, I think, you know, at our place and I think at many others, um, it's the same, it's many of the same characteristics that I think make a good chair, that you're uh, willing to engage in all of the missions of the department and therefore your division. Um, and that includes growing the division, philanthropy, research, clinical education, diversity, we could go on and on. And also just simply that you're someone who is excited about a role where you're gonna to have to give up some of your own personal gain in order to help others. In this case, your division, and you wanna spend time doing that. I think what it means is that it's not necessarily the most senior person in the group. It's not the most famous researcher or clinician in the group. It's someone who really wants to dedicate their time to this kind of mentoring and mission-based activities. You know, one of the things we, started Ralph when when I took over is that we, we have really formal searches when there's a division chief that um, is open and we allow everyone to apply and we have a search <laughs> committee. And one of the things that's been really helpful is that our division chiefs collectively with myself, Jane and the vice chairs have come up with a, a relatively long list of division chief roles and responsibilities. And we come back to it every year, once a year, and we collectively refine it. And so in that way, when it's time to think of who could be a new division chief, we can use that to say, these are the things you will be expected to do. Is this something you're, you're up for? Is this something you're willing to do? We'll probably come back later on to the, in the conversation of how we evaluate our division chiefs. We'll come back to that. But we use this same document as a sort of our true north as to what our division chiefs should be doing. And that's been very helpful for us. That's great. And searches are critical. I fully agree. And you're right about sometimes you have to take on mentoring, give up some of your own individual research career trajectory when a time for a division chief role or department. David, what are your thoughts here about characteristics of a good chief? Well, there are a lot of them. I think one of them is managing up and managing down and maybe a little managing sideways also, but you know, you've got to be able to lead your group and do that effectively, but also your division chiefs have to manage up with the chair and God bless my poor division chiefs having to deal with me. It's always a challenge to realize you're kind of a little bit in a middle, uh, mid-level position, uh, which can be uh, daunting as you're trying to advocate, but realize that you're part of a, a bigger puzzle. I think the ability to put one's team ahead of oneself, I think that's a really central concept that it's really, it may be it may feel really good to have the title of division chief and you're kind of climbing the ladder and you can feel rah-rah for a little bit, but then you should quickly realize that it's not really about you, that it's really about the success of your team and that's what's gonna dictate the overall success of your division and of the department uh, at large. Um, they have to understand how they fit in to the greater part of the puzzle, that it's really not a competition between the division chiefs, it's a collaboration understanding that you're part of a bigger community of the department, but then a bigger, bigger community of the institution. And are you fitting in with the overall mission? It can't always go your way. It's not like you have to compete for the dollars and there's only so much of the pie and you've got to get into a grabbing game. That never works. You've got to understand how your division works with the rest of uh, the, the, the department. I think people have to be really open-minded and open to growth. Uh, and new ideas and innovation. I think those are the people that really succeed. The people that I've seen not do as well as division chiefs have been people who are not very open-minded, who don't have good communication skills, because that's really essential. People who are selfish, uh, that never flies in a division chief. And maturity, although you can work with most people to help them to grow and mature in the job, if they really have a central problem 
with maturity, that, that's a death knell also. Yeah, great comments. And there are some other questions and comments. So I urge others, I hope they can see all the Q&A. Some other chairs out there are writing some good comments in about programs versus division chiefs and different tiers of programs and intersection with the hospital. So another good question that is being asked and something we wanted to deal with as we pivot now is not only the characteristics, the personal characteristics that makes up a, a good division chief, you know, what do we do to support that, uh, that, that kind of growth of division chiefs. And AAN is working on some things. Each of us have things in our departments. I wanted to hear from Claire first, particularly as uh, the new uh, department chair. And, you know, I've given some thought to what kind of training you think is helpful for a division chief. And one of the questions that came in was, can you speak towards selecting and training division health heads for these roles? Um, depending on what you expect them to truly oversee, or at least have some semblance of their portion of the business. Many, if not clinicians, are not exposed often to the business side of medicine. And a spectacular clinician does not always mean the one who will understand operations. So again, this is all about now, how do we best prepare the division chiefs for that role? Claire, you first. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, so, um... In, in the end, I think you, you, you jump in and, and um, you, you work really hard and you, you do it. But the, the preparation, I think I'm very grateful for some of the preparation that I, I did have. Um, I think we, uh, there's, there's a more traditional mentorship um, type of style. And I certainly had wonderful mentorship from my own chairs, including my chair who I left to take on this new position, who was just um, incredibly supportive and a great source of advice. And I, I, I thought that was absolutely great. Um, he had actually mentored me into the position of um, division chief and, and vice chair. And um, I think those were key for me um, in terms of developing more organizational skills and kind of being kicked forward a little bit to um, think more strategically about how to how to grow programs and who you need to communicate and um, who's, who, who you need to have on board for that type of thing. So um, I think the leadership roles that I, I did have um, were very good for that. Um, in terms of formal leadership programs, I think we were just saying before the call, you know, there's so much more available now than, than there was. So um, I haven't uh, participated in any of the AAN formal leadership programs. I think those are absolutely wonderful, though. Um, but where there were areas where I could pick off various um, topics, uh, mentorship was one. We had a fantastic um, uh, course every year through our CTSA at Wild Cornell in terms of developing yourself as a mentor. And there are lots of lots of um, other programs like that. And we, we even even now I love participating in the ones that the um, AAN runs. Um, in terms of the uh, business, there's there's a thing. One of the things that I realized is that as much as you understand in your own department and your own institution how things work when you go to a new institution it's a whole new world um, and I felt that one thing that would have been incredibly helpful would be to have more exposure to different styles so I came out of one um, one form of, of funding and moved into a clinical integration funds flow model which is uh, really completely different um, so actually in our own uh, department now I think my faculty are very aware that there's a, a need. And I have, I have some people who really want to develop and um, the division chief opportunities, the first one, and of course I don't want to lose them, but they will grow. Um, so we're, we're looking at a couple of different things. Our institution is um, about to put on some leadership programming through, and we've been looking at the business school, but I think this will actually come out of the C-suite um, for the medical center. Um, and then we're also putting on our own program. We're developing something for the, uh, the department that would address particular areas. It's going to be much smaller, of course, but, you know, addressing burnout or um, inter, inter, interpersonal conflict and, and this type of thing. So um, I, I found personally the formal training has been incredibly, incredibly valuable. Um, That's an important message. And we'll talk some more later about the AAN programs that you've been instrumental in helping develop. Uh, Brenda, how about you? What do you think? What do you need? How do you foster career development for a division chief or section chief? Right. Well, I think um, one clearer step well before they get to that level is to really look at what they aspire to do and what they love to do. 
Um, it's not about the title, it's about the job. Right. Um, and do you really want it? And for, and for the right reasons, uh, for one. Um, I, I, I tell my you know, future leaders that it's not a popularity contest, but in fact, great leaders are popular. And that those are two different things. Um, and um, you know, being a really good leader means that you can make a tough choice that's equitable and fair and transparent, but not always everybody, uh, not everybody's going to like it. Um, and you need to be able to lead through that um, uh, effectively. Um, and to acknowledge disappointment if you've had to make a tough choice that doesn't please everyone. And, and not everybody can actually do that. There are people who that just destroys them when that happens. And um, so you really have to tease that out early on. And if that's somebody, if, if somebody doesn't have that skill set or that sort of um, style of leadership, they can be cultivated and taught how to do that. But they have to know it's a gap. Um, because I think the leaders that I've seen sometimes really struggle actually can't take it when their friends and colleagues that they used to work directly with are now upset with them because they made a tough choice. Um, and so you have to mentor through that piece. Um, so one thing that I think is helpful in, in cultivating leadership is to do it in small epochs well before that, that stage. So leading a, a committee, um, uh, nominating somebody to be on a departmental or institution-wide initiative. Um, fostering them forward at the AEN. We're going to come back to that, which is something I've done, you know, for, for many, many, many faculty. That really helps. They, they develop that, that, you know, practice, if you will, um, to also see if they like it, which I think is really, really important. Um, and then now, Ross, you had some interesting things that you were telling us about uh, that are, again, a little bit more formal, but also focused on the business side. Tell us a little about what you've done. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as you alluded to earlier, Dr. Shacko, I think that, um, you know, many times developing faculty members or, or people that are, aspire for those roles aren't exposed to the business side of medicine and or, or just don't even know it's a variable in the equation that they're going to need to develop. So, um, you know, it's sometimes a bit of a surprise when guys like me approach them and when, when they're new in the job to say, hey, here's a profit and loss statement. And what do you what do you think about this? So uh, so to kind of minimize those surprises and really uh, make it very transparent, uh, we we developed a curriculum actually for uh, aspiring leaders and, and new newly appointed division chiefs um, to really grasp a, a lot of the administrative functions that they need to understand that for the business side of, of medicine, as you said. So um, the curriculum is aligned to our um, employee employed uh, physician network uh, to uh, pillars of success. So uh, we picked out three of them mainly to focus on, which is finance. So like I said, understanding your profit and loss statements, um, how does philanthropy roll into that? How does how's the different effort break up and where, where are the funding sources for that? Uh, productivity, how is it calculated? Why is it important? How does it, how does it roll into our, uh, our uh, compensation model? And then access. I mean, access is always such a black box for a lot of people and really unpacking that and helping them truly understand, um, you know, how we're able to help from an administrative standpoint, you know, uh, structure some things and, and be able to get that, um, get folks in quickly for them. Um, so for, for new folks, uh, new, newly appointed division chiefs, we, uh, we, fo we have focus sessions um, to focus on routine reporting within each of those pillars. So we have uh, routine reports that we provide on, on a uh, usually a monthly basis within each one of those pillars to each division chief for their specific group. Um, and, uh, and like I said, provide those on an ongoing basis. So in addition to the pillars, uh, we also provide other types of support. If you consider like an MBA light uh, style support uh, in terms of like marketing, uh, you know, it, it linking them in with our uh, with our marketing managers and cr crafting a specific uh, marketing campaign for that specific division for social media or uh, paid search or what have you. Um, strategic planning um, so that uh, between the department chair and the division chief, um, you know, there, there's a, a very clear vision that's set, you know, two to three years out into the future, uh, which aligns to recruitment strategies and, and regional deployment, as I said before, and philanthropy as well. So, uh, as we said before, you know, that's a big piece of an academic medical center and ensuring there's some ongoing support within those uh, departments and divisions. So, uh, just, a, just a quick recap of some of the things that we do for our faculty. Yeah, so, you really are breaking down and providing a lot of key uh, resource areas of development and all important areas of for division chief, as well as the department chair, which is great. Absolutely. Jane, how about from you? You have a big department with um, 
with Andy, what do you do in terms of an organizational way to develop the business acumen of your leaders? Well, I think, um, you know, it's a, the department is an organization. It's like a, like Ross said, it's an ongoing business entity. And um, like any organization, we've got to think of the different aspects and, and how it develops over time. And we started by talking about the structure and we've talked about the process as to how people communicate and interact and then what's the outcome. So I think we're always trying to calibrate um, the three aspects of having a successful department, having successful divisions, having successful faculty, and how do we roll out the information that these division chiefs need, not only to um, then have their division succeed, but how do they continue to appreciate the department, the need to be part of a strong department. So we gradually um, roll out more and more reports and, and give information transparently so they understand the economy of the department. And it's not something that we do overnight because it's, it's hard to grasp. And we find that different division chiefs have different um, you know, capacity to really understand the business aspects. Some get it like the second you say it, they could already win the Nobel Prize. And others, you know, three times later, you've said the same thing and they didn't quite grasp it. So we try not to make assumptions about, about that. But I would say it's a very, um, it, it happens over time. You know, that saying it's a marathon, not a sprint. I think you really have to be in when you're, when we are thinking of developing the, the department, the divisions, it's happening over time. So I think Andy gives a lot of thought to that. How much, how much information to give out this month? What, what type of decisions do we want people to make this month? It's, it's sort of calibrated. Right. And uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to really quickly say, Ralph, and, I, and you know, one of the things that's been uh, fun for us is developing just quite a camaraderie amongst the, the division chiefs. And we have a periodic, at least once a year, a division chief boot camp, an entire day where we use that time. What do you guys want to learn about? That's a time where Jane will often do some of this education regarding financial aspects, et cetera. We obviously meet much more, you know, we meet at least once a month, if not more. And so we, we've really tried to get the division chiefs together as a entity and, and thinking about how they relate to the entire department rather than just your individual structure. That, that's been a very successful strategy, I think, for us. So there are a couple of questions here that I want to try to feed in here. So one was talking about do divisions have their own budgets or the budgets managed centrally, pros and cons of that? Again, maybe UCSF, because you're big. Jane, what, how does it work financially? Uh, I think it's kind of a hybrid. I mean, we definitely manage um, our clinical funds flows centrally, and then uh, divisions get um, a share in that uh, for their part of it. And, and we don't run a separate P&L for each division, but they have their own financial reports monthly where they can see all of the research uh, dollars coming in from their faculty. They can see all the discretionary dollars that have been generated. They can, they can see everything. But um, within their, their division then, they do have complete um, autonomy in, to, to spend their own money, so to speak, as long as it's equitable with the department. And, but cent we do manage um, the major funds flow centrally. So it rolls up to still a big departmental budget. Obviously mm -hmm. under the research area, particularly for sub-projects, those are managed probably at some of the divisional level since they're, they're earmarked for specific research. Yeah, and that's really one of the problems with uh, you know, um, trying to, to, to demonstrate a department budget. It, it's almost a misnomer because really we have like um, a thousand little budgets. I mean, you can't say that if Claire's grant is underspent and I'm overspent and on, a, on, on paper, it looks like we're breaking even, but we're not. So I think that's really a hard thing to understand. There's no such thing really as a department budget, the whole all in that, that can easily be explained. They're all parts that fit together. Another question just to deal with here before we move to um, collaboration as a theme, is uh, any pushback to those who are developing divisions in, in departments that have a substantial traditional flat structure? Um, and then we talked a little about UCSF when it first was many years ago, a little more flat, but anybody received pushback that, you know, Claire, you're trying to move into a more of a divisional structure. Has there been any pushback from you or from anyone else uh, and in terms of favoring that flat structure? 
Yeah, I think there, there are different expectations from the people who are leading the groups. And um, some of them are following a model that uh, Jane just described, basically, which is, you know, you look at your finances and uh, centrally run, but but the, the divisions are really responsible for um, being financially responsible. And then there, there are other groups where um, I, I think that the uh, expectation is still to report, everyone would report independently up to the chair. And so I, I, I see putting in place formal divisions as a way of um, regularizing that. And um, I, we, we are developing um, a, a document with roles and responsibilities of the chiefs and um, to get buy-in, that's that's starting out with a small number of my faculty right now. And it's gonna be different for different divisions, like intensive care is gonna be different from multiple sclerosis, for example, but we wanna to try to get people pretty well on the same page. And so um, I'm trying to get buy-in from the uh, individual leaders on that. Anyone else uh, push back uh, if you had a flat structure? Ross is shaking his head now. Nobody had really push back. Um, okay. Um, we wanted in this section, since we're talking about career development, AAN has been working on some programs. I think Brenda and uh, Claire, and Claire, I want you to say, you can tell us a little bit about what we've been trying to develop to help division chiefs uh, in their career development. Yeah, so um, actually, I was looking back at some notes before this afternoon's um, webinar, and I see that we, we started, um, oh my goodness, we started way back in uh, 2018 in the fall, we began to have some meetings um, around centered around the um, needs um, of division chiefs and to try to address some of the unique challenges that they really face. So they're trying to um, balance the, the classic pillars that we always talk about, but really in this uh, very different environment of having to manage up, manage down, and like we said, manage sideways as well. So um, we had a series of meetings and some really great ideas came out of that. And our, our first program was um, back in May, 2019. Um, there was a, a program that was called a Division Chiefs Roundtable. This ran at the um, AAN annual meeting, um, maximizing effectiveness in addressing challenges. And we chose a couple of areas we, we had sent out, um, Lucy Perceau for the AAN had spent um, a lot of time putting together a list of chiefs across the country, and thanks to all the chairs who sent those in. Um, we sent a survey, um, and two of the uh, top um, areas of interest were, first of all, the chief's own career development, but also managing um, burnout, and uh, Brenda was one of the presenters at that. Um, Greg Berge from Hopkins and Amy brooks Kyle, who's another graduate of the um, division chief working group and is, is now a chair. Um, that I thought was a really great structure. We had um, a couple of presentations and panels. And then for the second part of the meeting, we had um, individual tables set up, little round tables, and then reported back. Um, there were also a couple of conversation corners that ran, um, and I, I attended um, both of those and tried to keep quiet, um, and they were just fantastic. Um, we actually then went into planning for another round table, which I, I know is um, given rise to a program that's going to come up, but uh, this was a, another area that had been identified um, in a survey, uh, basically where, where it was said that um, one, was it one in three chiefs um, felt they had communication problems with their chairs. And so uh, this was a program that was about managing up and chair chief synergy. And um, we had set up a wonderful program with Mary Sukovic and Brenda was going to be part of that. And then, of course, we had to put that on hold because of COVID. Um, we had a planned conversation um, that was going to happen in one of the experiential learning areas. And there were several other topics that we should look at that I think we were pretty well addressing today. Um, and uh, we had also, Andy mentioned the um, boot camp for chiefs. And I, I know that there's uh, interest in that and um, running such a program through Nerissa Co, through the AAN. Um, so the, these were uh, some of the-, the So uh, more yeah. things planned. Brenda, I know, is yeah. involved and the team is working on some other resources. At our annual meeting, which is virtual, obviously this year, there'll be a number of things that we hope to provide more resources in the future to help uh, division chief uh, development. Uh, I wanna pivot a little bit because it's been hinted and there were some questions about working together. You know, how do you get, you know, division chief is now the chief of their division. They want their division to succeed. How do you get people to work together, especially uh, rather than across purposes? David, what, what are your suggestions? I think the more that you can get people to work as a group together, the more they're going to be together. 
And I'm not talking about something like bowling night, although that's not such a bad idea actually, because it's fun and dorky. Uh, but we, we did a retreat, a four hour half day retreat, which was really um, uh, a great way to bring people together and get to know each other a little bit better. So the first half of it was just kind of telling each other's story, like how did they get there? What's important to them? Things that we really didn't know about each other and was really, really fun. People really liked it and became a lot closer through the process. And then you, we pivoted for the second half of it about what is our overall mission? What do we want to be? What are our core values? And what do we want to accomplish uh, in the future? So the more that you can have people rally around a point, uh, the better that they can do. The other thing that we did was develop a charter for what a division chief would be. Uh, like I, I had them come, come together with all their qualities that they thought was important for a division chief, not me. And then we all signed it, like kind of a, de a declaration of interdependence hmm. uh, that we really believed in what we were doing together. I think those kind of group activities where they feel empowered and that they are, uh, their voices are being very heard, those are the things that really bring them together and have them work uh, with each other rather than against each other. Right. And, you know, besides that, you know, division chiefs, we have to give them the tools to be effective. And Andy, you talked about things that are kind of formal mechanisms, providing them feedback and what they need to be, uh, continue that career development. Can you talk a little bit more about that, Andy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think some of it is the roles and responsibilities uh, document that we have that we, you know, evaluate people on on a regular basis. I think the other thing that we started doing uh, under the leadership of, uh, Claire mentioned, Narissa Co, who's my vice chair for diversity, but also really oversees the divisional structure and the development of our division chiefs, is that we started a stewardship review where we have a cycle where every few years, every division chief goes through a relatively formal, modestly time intensive process where they get anonymous feedback from all their staff, residents, um, uh, faculty members, et cetera. We have a small committee who then interviews people after a survey and comes up with a, at the end of the day, a, a quite a thorough report that talks about things that are going great constructive things that the division chief can work on. And that way we have a formalized 360 degree process. That's not just the chair saying how you're doing. I, I meet with the, the chiefs all the time. I meet with them individually at the end of each year to talk about things. But I think it's best to have this sort of 360 environment. And, and that's been very empowering. It's also allowed us to have for each division sort of an associate division chief whose job it is, hopefully a young person, someone who brings a little more diversity, who we're uh, mentoring to become a division chief. And that's been part of that process as well. Uh, an early pilot for us, only a couple years old, but I think something that's worked pretty well. The 360 is always great. Uh, and I think that's a great suggestion, getting that feedback. You know, you can always learn from a, a people above as well as below. Um, it's helpful, you have to sometimes have a thick skin, you know, and be able to deal with it if, if there are criticisms and hopefully it's construed as constructive criticism. So we wanna give our division chiefs the tools, uh, the feedback, the, the career development they need and it is helpful to get that feedback. I, that's a great suggestion. Um, we're getting close to the end here and I think we've covered most of the questions before we come to the end. There was one bigger question here about recommending growing divisions and departments marketing themselves at a medical center level to increase perceived value, especially as the divisions become successful, research, grants, national reputation. You know, I guess the question is sort of, do you market at the divisional level, department level? I know at our place we combine it, so the divisions are marketed in a group, but does anyone have a different answer? Do you do you market separately or do you market, market uh, combined? Anybody? Go ahead. We've, we've, well, we've just been asked um, oh, to. Uh, we've just been asked to come up with a strategic plan and identify a small number of programs that we would like to um, go out and, and and market and grow. Um, so uh, that's uh, we we're, we're taking um, our largest programs, I guess, and, well, and then we'll start we'll start with those, and then we'll work on the others. Great, Brenda, go ahead. Yeah, we market um, like obviously strategically, but also very specific program uh, in specific programs. So, for example, you know, with the increasing opportunities for different ways to treat epilepsy, um, you know, with device um, uh, mechanisms, et cetera, 
we are marketing specifically around that concept of, of advanced epilepsy care, um, as well as with epilepsy genetics, just picking sort of a, a group. So we're marketing the concept of advances in epilepsy care as just a marketing area. Right. Yeah, not, not a specific, it's not really one division, it's actually including neurosurgery, and right. it's, it's not neuropsych, it's, it's, exactly. Um, yeah, I, would, I would concur with, I would concur with that, um, Brenda, the programmatic approach, and, and we're part of a service line, so it's not just neurology, it'd be neurosurgery or psychiatry, it's more of a programmatic by service line at that point, not really a division or even a one clinical specialty. So in the remaining couple minutes, worst idea that you may have had, you're willing to share, keeping it brief, David, I know you already volunteered, a worst idea that didn't work like you thought it would. Any pearls? Well, I, I think that the, the biggest failing that I've had with my division chiefs is not being very clear on communications and expectations. I think that that's very easy to get, to, to, to forget their perspective and all, only be thinking from your perspective. And I think that that's where I failed my division chiefs time and time again uh, by not having them have to guess what I'm thinking. Um, and so I, I think it's a really important point to, to, to always try to put yourself in other people's shoes, no matter what the situation is, but particularly for the division chiefs who may often be confused as to what their role is, where do they stop and you start. Uh, and as they work with their, their group, where do they stop there and, and, and where do they start? So, you know, trying to be really explicit and clear with communications, whether it's oral uh, or written emails, all of them need to be consistent so they're not getting mixed messages. And not micromanaging them, right? We, we have to let them grow a bit. Obviously, you have to mentor and the balance between mentoring and micromanagement. Brenda, you offered any bad ideas that you want to share with us or not? I, I don't know if it was a bad idea in the long run, but I, I guess I'll share what it was like in my first year as a division chief and in a new country and you know, uh, coming into a, a big group. Uh, you know, I had so much to learn. Um, and so many things, and I had two former uh, division chiefs in my group, so I, I had lots of seniors, and, and, and there's me, and so I was killing myself to get everything done, and to try to be everything to everyone, as you do in a new job, I guess, and I decided that the one innovation thing I was going to do for the social aspect of the group was to have a large event at my home, um, you know, and it was going to be potluck so that everybody could come, nurses, families, um, uh, APPs, everybody, and I was so excited about making this inclusive event, and so I you know, I missed my family who had went up home to visit our family for that long weekend, was getting everything all set up and realized by a rather grumpy email that came to me that I had scheduled the whole thing on Father's Day um, and had not appreciated that at all. And um, so, you know, I was sitting there feeling very sorry for myself because I had done a ton of work on this thing. And so I wrote the, one of the most senior people in my group and said, I'm feeling really down. Like, I, I'm going to have to move this. I'm exhausted. I'm missing another family weekend. I don't know what to do. Um, and I don't know what she did, but the next day I had a, it was a change in tone in the whole division. There was so many more people to help. There were all these volunteers. We moved the whole thing. It was a wonderful event. Um, we still do it every time. It's been become our divisional, you know, major event of the year. Everybody comes. And I think the two things I learned were one, you know, reach out for help when you're trying to do a, a brand new job. And then if you get overwhelmed, reach out to someone senior in the group and let them know. And and because she just marshaled the troops, so we did not have it on Father's Day. We did have it a week later. It worked great, um, and it and was started, it started, a whole new tradition. started a whole new tradition. Um, so, I know we're at the end. I, I we did, we hopefully answered some of your questions. Um, mm -hmm. This was an attempt, and there'll be other resources coming regarding supporting division chiefs. Um, we appreciate everybody's attendance, and remember, we do try to record this. May not have been able to answer everybody's question, but we hope to provide other uh, resources for all those wonderful division chiefs or people who want to be division chiefs or even support to be future department chairs. Thank you to my panel. Great job today. I appreciate all your help and we will continue to help our division chiefs out there. Thank you and have a great day.